Let's pray. Oh, God, that's quite a prayer to begin this new season. Steal away. Steal away to Jesus. We're doing that right now. This is your house. He's here. And for the few moments we have left, engage our minds, but lean on our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got to tell you why I'm really pumped about this new year and this new year series that begins right now. We have a tradition. We've been doing it for years. Your pastors here at Pioneer. And that is on the first Friday night of the new year, we get together in our place. We have some hot drinks, sing some leftover Christmas carols, and have some time to pray. End the evening with that new year prayer. But a few years ago, we started a new little ritual, and we're, we're liking it. And here's what we do. We put a, a, a pile of uh, blank paper in the middle of the living room, and we put a box of colored markers, and we're going to take some time in our own quiet space, spouses, children, pastors, to, to wonder what should be our one-word New Year resolution. Can't be more than one word. It has to be one word. One word. So we think. Some start drawing pictures and color pictures. Others do calligraphy. Some just write down that one word when it comes to them. And then we hand the, the pages out so that I'm holding somebody else's. And, of course, we share that one word with everybody. And then we pray for the person that wrote this. Two Friday nights ago, here's the one word I, I wrote down. I'll put it on the screen for you. Prepared. Prepared. Everybody knows the word prepared. It's based on a line in the, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Everybody knows the story behind that one line. Come on, that's when Gabriel shows up to the rather stunned Zechariah the priest as he's leading out in worship that day in the Jerusalem temple. And he says, yo, I know about you and your wife. We, we know all about you. you. You're not childbearing. We understand that. But you're going to have a baby and you're going to name him John. And it will be his job to prepare Israel for the coming of the Messiah. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So I wrote it down. I have it. Because I put it on last year's, which was on the years before, which was, you know, so on. So I have it all on, my, on the wall where I have worship every morning in my study. Prepared. It's beginning to feel a lot like, not, not, not like Christmas. That's his first coming. Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Are we prepared? I'm talking about Andrews. Is Andrews prepared? Is Pioneer prepared? Prepared for what? The Messiah's second coming. That's, what's, that's what it's beginning to look a lot like these days, isn't it? I mean, we had house of prayer, 7 o'clock in the evening, 7 o'clock in the morning. Some of our, our uh, proactive prayer warriors were, were sitting there talking, and I hadn't seen this lineup before, but I said, you know what, you're right. They said, you know, look, look at what's happened in the first hours of the new year. We got Australia blazing, wildfires. Have you seen those videos? Wow. We got Puerto Rico. A once-in-a-century earthquake that has crippled their power grid and knocked the power out to, to that uh, island. Ew. And then on a quiet night in Baghdad, out of nowhere comes a drone missile, and suddenly the Middle East is thrown into chaos and confusion. And we got 10 incoming missiles from somewhere else in the same Middle East. And Oh, and then there's back at home, political deadlock. What's going on? It's beginning to look a lot like the second coming of Jesus. That's why I'm so pumped up about this new year and this new year series. No, this is not a, ser this is not a new series that's going to be on the return of Christ, although that series is going to need to be preached pretty soon. But as, as I think about the, what we're about to plunge into together today, I'm telling you what, this has everything to do with the return of the Messiah the second time. You see, this last fall, the church board of, the, of this campus church, the Pioneer Memorial Church, the leadership of this church, they're all volunteer leaders. They met. And they said, it's time to rebrand this church. Really? Yep. It's time to rebrand this church. It's time to rethink our mission and our vision. 
And so they voted a new moniker, a new theme, forwards long. I'm going to put it on the screen for you right now. There it is. That's the new logo. Every time you see that P with its, its little tail sticking outside the circle, because that's what pioneers do, they color outside the circle. When you see that little P, that's going to be pioneer for the, for the duration of the journey. But the four words on the bottom, that's the moniker. That's the, that's the vision. That's what pioneers been called to do. Love on the move. The big question is, what does it mean? Love on the move. What's that mean? But speaking of Zacchaeus, have you ever noticed how unpolitically correct that song is? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. I'm just wondering, are, are we allowed to call anybody we anymore? I mean, you might use vertically challenged, but you don't say we. Please. Not even Jesus calls him we. But you know what? Jesus calls him something. And it's what Jesus calls him in this story that everybody knows backwards and forwards that is the, is the secret to love on the move. Open your Bible to a story you could recite backwards. The Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19. Come on, you brought your Bible, you got your phone, you got your pad. Uh, listen, you didn't bring anything? Grab the Pew Bible in front of you. It's page 707 in your Pew Bible. Let's go. I'm in the New International Version. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus, you hear it all. But Zacchaeus is what you and I grew up with. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Whoa. Now, I learned something very interesting this week that I never knew, knew before about these tax collectors. The Latin name, because they were a Roman Empire phenom. The Latin name is, is publicanus, publicanus. From whence comes our word public and publican. So the King James actually gets it right. He's a publican. Now, the publicans were not just tax collectors. This is what I didn't know. They were agents of the Roman Empire who were in charge of providing supplies for the Roman legionnaires and the military. They were the port officials that received duty from every incoming ship in the empire, duty that goes to Rome. They were in charge of public building projects. I never knew all of that. Plus, they collected taxes. Well, that part I knew. But did you know this? They actually had to bid for the contract to collect those taxes, and they had to bid to the Roman Senate. The Senate would say, okay, you got the highest bid. You're going to have that job, buddy. Don't forget what you owe us. So you can understand. Because they weren't just Jews. If you were in Greece, you had Greek tax collectors. If you lived in Persia, you had Persian tax collectors. But the money's all going to Rome. You can understand, if you were a Jew, that a fellow Jew of yours who is working for the Roman Empire is in charge of public building projects and port duty and supplying the hated Roman army. Just that in itself, you would not be too drawn to this individual, now would you? And then to find out he, he bid on a contract to get money from you and he's going to get commissions for that money. Man, you know how you feel about this guy? He is hated and... That's what I think about you. You got a problem with that? So Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, when he shows up at a door knocking, and they're giving that little routine to him, and says, hey, hey, time out. Read my lips. You pay now or you're out. Do you understand? You see those soldiers behind me? We're going to repossess your house just like that. You pay, now, you pay up or you are out. It was hated. And by the way, we just read, he's very wealthy. That little commission goes a long, long way. Wow. All right. Let's read uh, verse 3, okay? And he, that would be Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was short. And he could not see over the crowd. When I was in the eighth grade, I was the next to the shortest guy in the class. Man, that was awful. And it was, by the way, it's a class of all boys, all boys, and I'm next to the shortest. Four boys. <laughs> a little missionary school. Come on, you have a problem with that? 
of course not. Anyway, I was next to the shores, and I knew, because I didn't know anything about uh, post-eighth grade uh, growth spurts, that I was going to be next to the shores for the rest of my life. The parents of Zacchaeus are figuring, you know what, honey, I think he's, got, I think he's going to get bigger after eighth grade. He never got bigger. No, he didn't. He was short. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see, he could not see over the crowd. So, so what's going on with this wee, wealthy tax collector? Here's what's going on. Desire of Ages tells us that Zacchaeus went to hear John the baptizer preach. And something about that preaching got to him, got into his conscience, got into his mind. In fact, Luke, Luke himself, in his gospel, actually records, in Luke 3, we won't go there, he actually records a dialogue between a, 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 a group of tax collectors and John the Baptist. Okay, here, here it is on the screen. Even tax collectors came to be baptized by John the Baptist. And they said to, to John, teacher, what should we do? And John replies to them, yo, you public canus, yo, don't collect any more than you are required to. That's it. But Zacchaeus knows that's not how he's been living. And there's something in the back of his mind. Oh, man. What am I going to do? Desire of Ages describes his troubled conscience. Put it on the screen for you. Zacchaeus knew the Scriptures and was convicted that his practice was wrong. Now, hearing the words reported to have come from the great teacher, that would be the young teacher from Nazareth, he felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God. Yet what he heard of Jesus kindled hope. How could it kindle hope when you're a, you're, you're a crooked cheat? Keep reading. Yet what he had heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart. Repentance, reformation of life was possible even to him. And then Zacchaeus is thinking in his mind, was not one of the new teacher's most trusted disciples a publican, a tax collector? Sure. Who was it? Matthew. Hey, he has a tax collector in his inner circle. Maybe there's hope for me. Last sentence. Zacchaeus began at once to follow the conviction that had taken hold upon him and to make restitution to those whom he had wronged. When your heart is under conviction, listen carefully now, when your heart is under conviction, do not ignore that conviction. You will do so to the killing of your soul. When your heart is under conviction, as Zacchaeus was, don't turn a deaf ear. But now Jesus is coming to town. This is the one who has a publican in his inner circle. And so, too short. I'll never get a chance to lay eyes on him. So, rather unusual to be sure. Verse 4, so Zacchaeus ran ahead of the crowd, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus, since Jesus was, was, was coming that way. I've seen the actual sycamore fig tree outside of Jericho, purported to be the very one that Zacchaeus climbed. I have no way to tell you if that's true or not because it looks very old to me. And it's big, huge boughs overstretch the road. And it's thick with foliage branches. Wow. And so here is wee wealthy Zac in that tree peeking out of the bushes saying, he's coming, he's coming. Hey, look, 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 he's coming, he's coming. He's getting closer, he's getting closer. Ah, I bet he won't even notice me up here. But, I, but at least I can see him from here. Oh my, come on, come on, keep reading. Verse 5, and when Jesus reached the spot, this is amazing to me. I spent some time this week just saying, how could this possibly be? When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. He looked up. Now look at how would you know to look up? Now sometimes you get, you get a feel that somebody's in space that you're not used to having somebody in that space. You know, you can do that, but if, the, if your question to me is, because I kind of have this worked out now, if your question to me is, Dwight, how did he know to look up? My, ans my, my answer is, somebody told him to. And you're saying, oh, that's a bunch of hokey pokey. Oh, really? Let's talk about the NFL. We have a few football fans who are sitting here right now. Let's talk about the NFL. Do you know that the quarterback in the NFL has an earpiece in his helmet? There's only one person on earth that is allowed to speak into that earpiece, and that's the offensive coordinator. 
Not the coach. No, no, nobody. Just the offensive coordinator. And while the quarterback is in the middle of plays, there's somebody that can, inter, that can interject a voice. You got a problem with that? Take it up with the NFL. So if the Holy Spirit wants to do the same, shall we be, shall we be upset? Say, well, that's not fair. You can't do that. <laughs> Forget it. Look, the other day, I went to a store. I saw a girl, and I said, hi. I knew the girl. I said, hi. I finished my duties, and I leave the store, and as soon as I leave that store, I hear a voice in my earpiece, and the voice says, go back and talk to that girl. What were you thinking? <laughs> so I said, okay, I will. And I did. I don't have a problem with that. I recognize the voice. Jesus hears only one voice that he loves to hear. He hears two voices because they both have access to his earpiece. But he knows the voice that says, look up right now. You'll see a man. Zacchaeus. You heard about him the other day. This is he. Invite yourself to his house. Okay. Oh. Jesus looks up. Well, let's finish that verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot and he looked up and, he's, and he's, he looked up. And of course, he obviously sees Zacchaeus. He says to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay in your house today. Because the voice also said, he's lost. But we can win. Isn't that something? Jesus hears his voice, and he obeys. And what does Zacchaeus do? Oh, my. Zacchaeus is up there pinching himself. Is, is this a dream? Is this really? The famous teacher is coming to my house. He, oh, what am I going to do? And he's scrambling down. And uh, where is this? Verse 6. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. They're in the house. Now, watch this. The people see what's happening here. I want you to catch this. Verse 7. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, speaking of Jesus, he has gone to be the guest of a, of a, of a sinner. Ladies and gentlemen, if that verse is not marked in your Bible, then you mark your Bibles, then circle it, star it, put the fluorescent yellow all over it, because that little verse is the, is the quintessence of the everlasting gospel. And that is Jesus is a friend of sinners. I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care what your rap record is. I don't care what your private reputation is because only you know your private rap record. I don't care what you've done in your life. If you're a sinner like me, then this is very good news because he goes to be with sinners. He majors in sinners. How about that? Wow. Yep, it's the gospel. And of course, of course, when this happens, the Pharisees and the, the uh, gossipers in that little city go, they go nuclear. They throw a massive tizzy fit. I can't believe it. Look, look, look. But before Jesus can say a word in defense of Zacchaeus, watch this. Zacchaeus jumps up. So it's obviously in his house. Zacchaeus jumps up in verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord. And by the way, in the, well, the homes of the wealthy in the time of Christ, your home was not your home. If you had a big dinner there, the, the town would show up hoping for a little something to be handed out. So there are people sticking into the windows. They're all, they're all listening to it. So he, he's, he's making a speech to them, but he's saying, hey, Jesus, Master, look. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, the Levitical code is very clear. If you have, if you have swindled somebody... If you have cheated somebody out of their own money, you are to pay them double back, double. Zacchaeus takes that principle and he says, I'll double the double. First, I'll give half of my goods to the poor. The rich young ruler came along and said, I can't give a penny to the poor. I wish I hadn't made it so hard. Zacchaeus says, I'll give half of everything I own to the poor. 
And then a four times, a four times the law. My, my, my. And Jesus, Jesus is sitting there and he's saying, that's what that voice in the earpiece was about. Look what's just happened here. The man has not only confessed publicly, but he has now made effort toward restitution. It's not just enough to say sorry to somebody after you've, you've messed them up, you've taken what's theirs. Of course you give it back, unless you can't. So Zacchaeus did, and Jesus said, excuse me, thank you for that speech, Zacchaeus. Can I make a little speech now? And Jesus, Zacchaeus says, please, my Lord, stand. So Jesus stands, and here comes Jesus' speech, and this is something else. Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, with everybody leaning in through the windows, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this household. It says house, but he's talking about everybody in the house. Salvation has come to this household because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. The Pharisees kicked him out with, that, with, with their leather boots, good riddance to bad rubbish, and don't you ever turn around. And Jesus took the hated Zacchaeus, and in one move, he draws him into the chosen people. This man has a table has a seat at the table of Abraham in the kingdom to come. And so, do his, so does his wife and children, and so do all the servants. So does everybody in this house. Wow. I mean, how could you do that? you got to be Jesus to do it. And he did it. Isn't that amazing? Man. Jesus is the friend of sinners who restores them to the chosen. Oh, I tell you, the, the, the uh, worship team today... Uh, Vivian was absolutely right. That, that, that was uh, inspired singing on your part and, uh, and their leading. So I grabbed this, this, this sheet that we, the um, run sheet here, and I, I look at those words. We just, we just sang them. Because you see, what Jesus has just said to Zacchaeus, we sang about, where we sang, I am chosen, not forsaken. You remember that? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Who'd you say I am? Je Jesus, would you repeat that one more time? I need the people outside to hear that too. What did you say? You, I am a child, a son of Abraham now. Yes, you are. Oh, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. That's the truth about Jesus because he is a friend of sinners. What do you say? Amen. He's a friend of sinners. I am what you say I am, Jesus. And I say you're forgiven. And I say you're chosen. And I say you are my friend for the rest of your life. Wow. The greatest line of all, I've left it out. I think it's one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture. Come on. There's, there's verse 10, Dwight. Don't forget verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what those four words mean. Love on the move. <laughs> it's all about moving out and being friends to sinners. That's what it means. Love on the move. It means to seek and save. I mean, you think of, of the moving picture of Jesus right here. Do you understand that Jesus is the incarnation at this moment in the story? He's the incarnation of divine love. All the divine love in the universe is put into human flesh in Jesus. And who are you? You are a disciple of Jesus, which means that wherever you go, he's taking all of his love, and he's incarnating his love into you so that wherever you go, that love goes too. Love on the move is not just about Jesus. Love on the move is about you and me. When we follow the master, his love comes in, incarnates itself in us. Oh, my. Jesus. I mean, you think about it. Zacchaeus. Politically. Okay, politically. Let's just Some of you are into politics. Zacchaeus, who is politically the dark opposite, not only of the Jews, but the polar opposite of the Savior himself. Allied as Zacchaeus is with Romans' pagan and political values that Jesus has already publicly rejected. That's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who is the, the polar opposite of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Everything Zacchaeus stands for is diametrically opposite to what Jesus stands for. But Jesus gets out of his own comfort zone and steps into that other world. And says, hey, 
I want to be a friend with you. Are you okay with that? And Zacchaeus says, me? You talking about me? Yeah, Jesus had, a, Jesus had his own rap sheet among the Pharisees. Oh, I tell you, they, God bless them. Do you know what the Pharisees were saying about Jesus? Jesus one day earlier in Luke actually tells us what the Pharisees were saying. He's talking to the Pharisees. I'll put this on the screen. Don't turn and look, look it up. But it's, it's Luke 7, verse 34. Jesus says, okay, I know, I know what you're saying about me, guys. I've heard it. You're saying that the Son of Man came eating and drinking, okay? So you're talking about me socializing. And then you say of me, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I know what you're saying about me. And guess what? I am guilty as charged. I am a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wow. What a Savior. A friend of tax collectors and sinners? I guess you and I could be friends of tax collectors and sinners too then, couldn't we? Because that's what love on the move means. It means we must move into Zacchaeus' space. We, we got to quit sitting right here and expecting Zacchaeus to move into our space. Too much of that's been going on around here. Well, Zacchaeus, when he shows up here, give me a few weeks with him, and then I'll decide if, if, if that's what I want to do, be a friend of his. No. Zacchaeus doesn't move into this space. You move into Zacchaeus' space. We can't just sit here. We got to mingle with the crowd out there to find him. We may find her in the cafeteria, by the way. Oh, yeah. We may find them in the health club, at the gym. Oh, yeah. We may find him in the corporate boardroom. Yep, yep, yep. We may find them on the street, just on the street. But that's where we find them. Love on the move means we go to them. Now, he may be in a rather unusual position. She may be in a most unusual predicament. It doesn't matter. Love on the move is looking for him. Never mind his political persuasion. Never mind her sexual orientation. Never mind their reputation on or off campus or in this community or out of this community. Love on the move means the people of Pioneer every morning wake up and pray a, pray a prayer halfway similar to this. Please, dear God, live out Jesus' love on the move in me Today, please, just live it out for me today. Is that, a, is that, is that too, too bad a prayer to pray? No, just, just live it out to me today, please. To the parents of the child who's been dropped off for Sabbath school, the parents who never stay for church, if you're one of the workers in the Sabbath school, love on the move means you move after those parents. Don't you wait for those parents to come back and say, I'm finally ready to come to church. You go to them. They're entrusting their child to you. You go to them. You know where they live. Love on the move. Love on the move means for the stranger who enters our gates to worship, maybe sitting by you right now. Don't look. Don't, don't look. Don't. Oh, you don't want to be awkward. The stranger who is sitting beside you right now within our gates. Love on the move means you, you move to that stranger. You introduce yourself. They say, hey, come on over. Let's have a humble little lunch together. Love on the move means love to the estranged runaway child. She has run away from her parents, and somehow she's run into you, and you hear her dilemma, and without taking sides, you embrace this little girl, and you say, listen, 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 honey, we'll be with you right now. That's love on the move. Wherever, whomever, just like Jesus. You know that never, never, he's never going to be a jock guy. I mean, when they choose up teams, whether it's for the big Cardinals or some other team, when they choose up teams, he never ends up on the team. He's the never jock, and you're the big jock. Love on the move means you realize there's somebody that would like to be a part of a little circle where you are, and you break out of your circle into his life, and you say, hey, listen, I want to get to know you. Can we be friends? It's just outside of your circle. That's why it's on the move. Love on the stay is, come to me, and then I'll decide whether I love you or not. Love on the move means, no, I'm, I'm headed your way, just like Jesus. Wow. 
Plain and simple. Love on the move. Can a whole church be like this? Absolutely. I believe with all my heart. I want to end with a story. Oh, this story. This is really a great story. It's in your Sabbath school lesson quarterly. This great study that we're doing now in the book of Daniel. I couldn't believe it. When I saw it, after the first week, you know, they put these little stories in at the end of every, every, uh, every lesson. And when I saw the headline, Make Friends, Not Adventists, I said, is this from World Headquarters or what? <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. Make Friends, Not Adventists. Now, I'm really curious. So I read on. Igor Gotspodaretz ordered 800 colorful evangelistic posters reading, Bible opens a path to a healthy and happy life. He ordered them from Moscow. He plastered the advertisements around his city in a former Soviet republic where a majority of the population is not Christian. Then an elderly evangelist told him to start over. Yo! Order 800 new posters advertising the Seventh-day Adventist Church's five-day stop-smoking program, said Arturo Schmidt, the evangelist from Argentina. Igor couldn't believe his ears. The posters had taken considerable money and time to put up, and he didn't want to have to start from scratch again. Why, he asked. And the evangelist replied, our goal is not to make Adventists out of non-Christians. Our goal is to make friends. Hmm. It was 1992, only a year after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Igor, a young Adventist pastor, was eager to take advantage of newfound religious freedom to share his love for Jesus. He didn't like Schmidt's advice. It didn't make sense to him not to preach Jesus. He didn't see the logic of offering stop smoking classes. He didn't want to lose the money invested in those evangelistic posters, so he prayed about it. Finally, Igor decided to take a chance. Perhaps the elderly evangelist knew something that he didn't, so he orders 800 stop-smoking posters from Moscow and places them all over the old posters that were already hanging. A surprise greeted Igor's eyes when he showed up for the first stop-smoking seminar. The rented hall was packed with 1,000 people. Whoa. Most of the visitors were not Christians. He realized that the original posters never would have attracted so large a turnout. Five years later, now listen, after a Sabbath sermon, a stranger reached out to shake Igor's hand, Pastor Igor, in the church. Do you remember me, the man asked. Igor did it. Well, I was in that crowd of 1,000 people that took the stop smoking class five years ago, the man said. I heard you and Pastor Schmidt speak. The man explained that he had been raised in a non-Christian home and had been struggling to quit smoking and the seminars had helped him stop and realizing that the Adventists were his friends, he had started attending church every Sabbath. Igor could not believe his ears. It was at that moment that I understood the importance of friendship evangelism. And Igor, now a church leader in southern Russia, goes on. Our goal is not to make Adventists out of non-Christians. Our goal is to make friends for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love on the move. That's what it's all about, to make friends for Jesus. Yeah, but Dwight, come on. We, we, we got to get people to join the church and become Adventists. You might. In fact, with a friendly person like you, I'm just thinking that they probably will be drawn because of the warmth of your heart. But even if, they, even if they're not, love on the move is not only for people that might become, love on the move is for people who are loved by God and need to know Jesus as the friend of sinners. It's still love on the move. And it's still the right time to win friends for Jesus. What do you think? What do you say? Well, that was really weak. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. That was very weak. I'm asking you one more time. Four words, new moniker. Don't you think it's the right time and that we ought to expend our best energies winning friends for Jesus? What do you think? Amen. Ah, me too. I want to take an extra moment to thank you for joining us in worship today. It's by the continued support from viewers like you that we're able to bring you this program. Today I want to invite you though to share with us how this ministry has blessed you. I get inspiring notes, emails from viewers literally all over the world telling me, look Dwight, God has been blessing me this way. He's been doing this. I would love to hear from you as well. Just visit our website, you know it, newperceptions.tv and click on the contact link at the top of the page. Send me a note. Let me know what God has been doing right now in your life. 
Once again, thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us right here next time. And until then, may the God of grace journey with you every step of the way.